Awesome. Thank you so much, Debbie. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure for me today to talk a little bit about my uh, postdoctoral um, project uh, that I've been carrying out here in the Quadrato Lab at USC. So one of my main focus uh, during my postdoc has been to dissect mechanism of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and these disorders uh, can be classified, uh, uh, for example, for autism, intellectual disability, developmental de delay, and many others. And one of the characteristics of these disorders uh, is that they're highly heterogeneous uh, in terms of their severity across patients. And this can be due to the fact that these disorders are um, due to polygenic mutations, but also due to the fact that the genetic background of each individual plays a role in the severity of uh, the disorder. And so, uh, especially for the uh, phenotype uh, or clinical uh, phenotype that presents for these disorders, uh, one of the main um, impairments are associated with high order functions. And these functions are known to be associated with the specific areas of the cortex within the human uh, brain. However, when we try to uh, study these disorders, uh, especially in the context of rodent models, uh, we really need to address the fact that there is a difference in the um, in the architecture, cyto cyto uh, architecture of the of the brain, but also in the cell type uh, composition, and so it's really important to study uh, and to use human tissue. However, we all know that, uh, especially early in, the, in development, uh, this tissue is uh, very difficult uh, to access. And so uh, this leads to a need for a uh, human-specific model. Uh, and so what we are now able to do in the lab is to actually uh, derive uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from, uh, uh, for example, ASD patients and healthy donors from skin or blood uh, uh, samples. And then following specific pro uh, protocols, uh, we can actually pattern these uh, stem cells to adopt uh, a cortical or a brain-like uh, fate. And so what we can generate are these 3D cultures uh, uh, that are called uh, uh, organoids. So in, our, in my case, I've been focusing on using uh, brain organoids. And I've been using this model, uh, models specifically to look at uh, one of the top autism-associated genes, which is SYNGAP1. And the uh, clinical presentation, uh, as I mentioned before, it's quite diverse. So it has been associated with the intellectual disabilities, uh, epilepsy, autism, and many other clinical uh, phenotypes. And so if we look at the uh, known function of SYNGAP, uh, in the literature, uh, we know that SYNGAP plays an important role at the postsynaptic uh, density of excitatory neurons. Uh, so uh, let's see, most of the uh, work uh, has been done uh, in rodents uh, and only recently this function has been shown to be uh, also um, true and present in human induced uh, monolayer uh, neurons. Uh, so when I joined the lab, the Quadrato lab, uh, my uh, project was to dissect the function of SYNGAP in a more physiological uh, human uh, environment, so in an organoid model. So what I started to do was to look at the expression of SYNGAP. So I started to look at the expression of SYNGAP in human uh, fetal development. So here we just reanalyzed the single cell sequencing uh, uh, data that was available from human fetal uh, tissue at different time points here. And by looking at the expression of SYNGAP, we could see that over time there was an increase in expression uh, along the line with the known function of SYNGAP in uh, mature excitatory neurons. Uh, 
However, when we looked at the RNA expression um, of SYNGAP by cell type, we could find SYNGAP also in radial glia cells, uh, which are the pro, um, progenitors of the neurons and the developing cortex. So this was really surprising to, to us and something that was not uh, been described uh, before. So we wanted to um, prove and uh, really to confirm the presence of, uh, of SYNGAP as a protein. So what we did was to uh, grow two month uh, old cortical organoids. And here what you can see are uh, SOX2 positive uh, progenitors in green that are forming these ventricle-like structures. So these progenitors, after proliferating, they will migrate out of the ventricle and they will populate um, the outside area and generate, uh, they will become neurons. So when we stained for SYNGAP1, we did indeed find the expression of SYNGAP in the neuronal component. But what was really surprising was also to find SYNGAP within the ventricle, so within that progenitor uh, area. Um, and so we performed the mass spectrometry at day seven of organoids when we have a homogeneous population of these progenitors. And we confirmed the presence of the peptides for SYNGAP, but also we could find among the interactors the presence of TJP1. That is here in the immunons, uh, we confirmed, and so the presence of this tight junction protein that is really important to maintain the integrity of these uh, uh, ventricles. And so to start uh, dissecting the role of SYNGAP in uh, uh, human radial glia cells, we performed uh, at first a bulk RNA sequencing of day seven organoids uh, derived from a patient carrying a PQ503X mutation that give rise to haplin sufficiency for the SYNGAP protein. And we compared it to a control that is uh, derived from the same patient line, but we CRISPR corrected uh, uh, specifically that mutation. And so the uh, differentially expressed uh, terms uh, were all related to cell motility, locomotion, and migration. And when we looked at the interactors of SYNGAP within the same day seven progenitor organoids, uh, we could find that most of the proteins uh, uh, that are interacting with SYNGAP had have a specific function in actin and also cytoskeleton, suggesting that SYNGAP at these early stages might regulate cytoskeletal remodeling. And uh, cytoskeletal remodeling in radial glia cells is really important in the context of the developing cortex. So here you see a schematic of radial glia cells where um, these cells uh, extend two different processes. One apical process uh, towards the lumen of the ventricle, where tight junctions such as tight ju uh, junction uh, protein 1 or TJP1 protein are really important to maintain the integrity of the ventricular wall. Uh, on the other side, instead, these radial glia cells extend uh, an apical, uh, a basal domain uh, and cytoskeletal process uh, that is really important for uh, the neurons, uh, once they are generated, to migrate to the proper layer of the cortex. And so to start modeling uh, these very early stages of radial glia, uh, organization and formation of the ventricle, we collaborated with Randy Ashton, uh, who developed a 2.5D assay where we have radial glia cells that uh, over time will start organizing and forming uh, a single ventricle, also called uh, single rosettes. And so we uh, compared uh, the corrected patient corrected line and the patient line in their ability to generate these single ventricles or rosettes. And what we could see was that in the patient one, there was a clear disruption of the radial organization of these cells around the ventricle. And when we looked at their ability to form actually rosettes, the patient line was almost not able to generate single uh, rosettes. 
And so we performed the same experiment with different uh, other lines. Uh, so here you see a O3231, it's a healthy uh, control IPSC line. And in this line, we actually inserted uh, with CRISPR uh, the same mutation of the patient uh, that I've just showed you uh, in the previous slide. And what we could see was that the impairment in generating single ventricles or rosette was similar to the uh, patient line, suggesting that in this case, the genetic background does not affect the severity of the phenotype. And finally, what we did was also to target a specific domain of the protein, the RASGAP domain, and uh, rendering it uh, non-functional. And so when we did that, what we saw was that most of the uh, progenitors were not able to form uh, single rosettes. And so uh, this suggests that this specific domain might be uh, the domain in charge of this cytoskeletal uh, properties or function in radial glia uh, cells. So but of course, all these results I've shown you are early at early stages when we have only progenitors. So what we wanted to do was to leverage the cortical organoid uh, model to uh, look at the generation of neurons. So here you see a two-month-old uh, cortical organoid, where we have here, again, the very um, dense and concentrated uh, progenitor, uh, area and then the neurons that are um, just positioning outside of this area. And so when we generated the Schumann old uh, organoids from the patient line, what we could see was the presence of neurons here in green and also in red already within the progenitor zone, something that we have never seen in the control organoids. And when we looked at the different uh, at the division mode of these progenitors laying around the the ventricle, what we could see was that in the patient uh, organoids, these cells were undergoing uh, uh, more differentiative divisions, meaning they were generating more neurons upon division. And this suggests that single insufficiency impairs the developmental trajectory of human radial glia cells. And to confirm and look, uh, look uh, at this even more in detail, we perform single cell sequencing uh, um, at Schumann. And here we have all the different class of cells that we find uh, in, uh, in these organoids. And we focused our attention on apical radial glia cells. So, and when we compare these apical radial glia cells between the cor corrected organoids and the patient organoids, uh, what we uh, could see was that uh, the apical radial glia in patients has had the down-regulated terms related to mitotic or, uh, divisions. So, whereas in the upregulated terms in the patient, we could see uh, clear terms of synapse and neuron development, even though these are still radial glia cells, really confirming uh, that there is an impairment in the trajectory, developmental trajectories of these radial glia cells. So, and so finally, we also kept uh, these organoids in culture for longer uh, at four months. Um, and so what we could see was that in four month old, uh, different types of uh, um, neurons had an increased uh, markers for uh, maturation markers. And this was also confirmed uh, by uh, calcium imaging and electrophysiology, where we could see that there was actually an increase in uh, uh, activity from in the patient and also in the control with the patient mutation. And so all of this was done and this novel function of SYNGAP was uh, found and uh, characterized in cortical uh, organoids. So, however, like going back to the SYNGAP patient um, phenotype, we uh, also noticed that uh, some of the phenotypes were related to non-cortical tissues. 
And one uh, of the um, clinical manifestations that got our attention was the gastrointestinal dysfunction, where a lot of the patients have uh, comorbidity for these disorders. And so this is just preliminary data of what I'm currently investigating uh, by, uh, we looked uh, at already available single cell, single nuclei uh, um, data set of gut tissue. And uh, at first, what I did was to look at the expression of here are the 102 uh, top autism associated genes in the gut uh, tissue. And what we could see was that sing up here uh, was specifically enriched in some population of enteric neurons. And so I adopted uh, a protocol that was already uh, published for generating uh, enteric neurons. And here we can generate vagal neural crest cells, uh, and later these cells are maturing uh, into enteric uh, neurons already within uh, 25 days of uh, differentiation. And so I generated enteric neurons from the uh, control and the single patient line. And what I could see already from uh, qPCR data was an increase in upregulation of genes, uh, maturation genes uh, within the patient uh, enteric neurons. And when we looked at the functionality of these cells, uh, we could see that in this case also, there was an increase in, act in activity for the single patient uh, enteric neurons, uh, suggesting that also uh, outside of the cortex, but in the enteric neurons, uh, single insufficiency seems to affect enteric neural crest differentiation and maturation. And so currently, uh, what I'm doing in the lab is to generate a more physiological model where we generate uh, intestinal organoids and enteric uh, neurons. And here, uh, my aim is to investigate even further the function of SYNGAP within gut physiology and human uh, in within this human ENS uh, organoid model. And so with this, I just want to conclude then hopefully I've shown you how we were able to um, describe then a non-function for seeing up in regulating human cortical neurogenesis. And this work really reframes our understanding that well-known synaptic proteins uh, um, are actually expressed and might have uh, uh, a specific function at early stages of development. And this is true not only for seeing up, but for uh, many other top uh, autism associated genes. And with this, I want to thank uh, all the lab, uh, especially my mentor, uh, Georgia, and all the agency funding. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. I'm thank happy you, to see any yeah, questions. Thank Thank you, Marcella, for a really great talk. Um, we're a little over time, so mm -hmm. I want to open it up to questions. Um, if you would like to throw a, ch a question in the chat real quick, we can take one or two questions, Max. I'm going to ask you one question then, um, which is that you've shown that SYNGAP1 looks like it's localized. Um, where apical end feet would be. And I'm curious if you've looked at its expression or potential function in outer radial glia, which lack ap apical end feet and whether it may be down-regulated or, or play a role in that transition. Yeah, we haven't looked specifically at that. I mean, in sections mm -hmm. of the organoids, uh, you know, in organoids, we don't have, at least in ours, uh, so uh, much outer radial glia. Um, so we couldn't see, uh, at least at the protein level, uh, high expression uh, of SYNGAP. So for sure, yeah, as you mentioned, not localized within the epical, uh, within one side. But uh, one project in the lab is currently looking at lineage tracing. So we're looking how with SYNGAP upper insufficiency, there is a disruption in a possible, uh, you know, branch of the outer radial glia uh, population. But yeah, we still... Don't know. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm going to take one question from the from the Q and A. Um, uh, what do you think? And if you can answer briefly, it would be great. What do you think is happening at the cellular level to um, 
to explain the increased maturation phenotype that you see? Uh, sorry, I, I don't do you, see. Do you have a sense of how, what the mechanism, cellular mechanism is that's driving the enhanced um, precocious neuronal maturation? maturation? Yeah, so for the maturation, uh, mm -hmm. that is linked with the function, non-function of SYNGAP uh, in the insertion of AMPA receptor within the postsynaptic density. Uh, what we think uh, is happening is also due to this cytoskeletal uh property of SYNGAP, there is also a disorganization of the network. So it's not only at the postsynaptic level, but it's really a network that is not well organized because the neurons do not migrate properly to the proper layer. So it's both postsynaptic, but also um, at the yeah, organization of the structure of the layers.